Welcome to Morningstar Christian Chapel. If you're watching on YouTube, please remember to hit that subscribe button, like button, and the notification bell so you can find out when we go live or we post a new video. And be sure to leave a comment about what God has shown you in this message. Thanks, and enjoy the study. All right, let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. John was in his 90s when he was exiled to an island just off the coast of Ephesus, 30 miles or so out to sea. And the Lord visited him and gave him this book that we call the Revelation of Jesus Christ. It is really the summing up of all that the Bible presents to us. Without it, we certainly don't know how it is supposed to end. We don't know if what God says will come to pass, and yet we've been, it has been laid out for us methodically here. John receives in chapter 1 a vision of Jesus in his glory. And then he is told in verse 19 to write what he's seen. Then to write about the things which are, as we've told you, uh, the second and third chapters are the church age. And that's what he's writing to. That's his, his first vision, if you will. And then to write the things that would come after the church age. And that'll begin in chapter 4 with the rapture of the church and the second vision that John is given. And they're always introduced kind of separate from one another. So what we have been studying, and tonight we're in the six of the seven letters that Jesus writes to the churches, seven being the number of completeness or fullness. We went over that in our introduction, I think, or maybe the second week. Um, but it is truly all that the Lord would want the church to know. It is first person delivered. It is the only thing first person delivered that you have in the Bible to the church. There's a lot of second and third persons, but this is the Lord speaking directly to the church what he wants us to be, what we are facing, what he knows we have to struggle with. Um, it is for that reason we've taken one church a week and we've not tried to rush through it. Um, they're personal letters because the church is people. At the end of every letter you will read words that say to the effects of, uh, you know, whatever the Spirit is saying, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And the word hear is, is singular, but the word church is plural. So God speaks to us individually first, speaks to the church as a whole. All seven of these churches um, existed in the first century. They were all having the same issues, facing the same um, governmental restrictions, if you will, and that, yet the Lord uses them to, to highlight for us the kind of things that the church has to be uh, careful of. It is written to congregations because they're addressed to the pastors of the churches, the acholos, the angels of the churches as you read them. And it is, it is also... Uh, I think it's supposed to be looked at prophetically. And we, we'll, we'll lay that out for you once more next week before we turn from that all together. But these seven churches, when taken in the order that we're given, is a pretty good outline of church history from the time that it was born, the book of Ephesus, to the time of the Lord's coming for the church, chapter 4, verse 1, when the church is no longer here. So Ephesus atten uh, it was, it was a church that is represented to maybe the first uh, the first century, 100 AD or so, it was a, a church that had been around for 60 years. Um, but at the same time, oh, I'm sorry, 35 years, it was born in the 60s. Um, it had lost or, or had left, it hadn't lost, it had left its first love. The motivation for loving the Lord had, uh, had departed from the church. And, and Jesus talks to them about the fact that he looks at why we do what we do. The Smyrna church, the second church, which was a church that faced tremendous persecutions from the Romans for about 200 years. Um, the Pergamos church was a church that followed the coming to power of Constantine, who was able to mix every religion together. He made Christianity the state or the world religion for, for the Romans, if you will. It found very few saints and lots of aberrant theologies and beliefs that the Lord said he hated. The Thyosira church, which came in about the 5th century or so, uh, from a prophetic standpoint, were, were called the Dark Ages, the Middle Age, Ages. It ran all the way through to the to the um, Reformation, if you will. It was it was known by perverse doctrines and and much uh, false teaching. The Sardis Church, after the Re Reformation, had a church a name that lives. We looked at it last week. It was called the Christian Church, but there were a lot of folks who didn't live up to the name. And so they were going through their religious pra practices, but they weren't walking with the Lord. Which leaves us with these last two churches from a prophetic standpoint, both Philadelphia, 
and Laodicea, which appear to be, from all that we can gather from a uh, historical perspective, the, the two branches of the church that we be in the world at the time of the Lord's coming for the church. They come at the end of chapter 3, obviously. They also speak to um, the outgrowth, if you will, or the long-term outgrowth of the, Ref uh, of the Reformation. There are plenty of Protestant churches today that are teaching the Bible and loving the Lord, and they are certainly represented by this Philadelphian church. Um, but then there are plenty of churches who deny the authority of the scriptures, who try to fit into the world intellectually. There's a lot of aberrant teaching these days where the Bible has been set aside. So we're going to look at Philadelphia tonight, the remnant, godly remnant, the shining remnant. We'll leave the last one, obviously, the compromised church uh, for next week, as the Lord puts it at the end, before the rapture of the church. Historically, there was a tremendous... Um, evangelistic kind of explosion that followed the Reformation from about 1750 A.D. through the end of the First World War. And there was a, uh, statistically, there were so many people coming to know the Lord that, that it, it stands out in, in, in church history as, as almost unparalleled. It, it began in Europe, it was later followed in the United States, guys like Whitefield and and Wesley, and Spurgeon, and Finney, and Edwards, and Moody. There were hundreds of thousands of people saved. If you ever want to get a feel for reading about that time, I would suggest you Warren Wearsby's book. It's called Walking with the Giants. It's a really well done overview of, the, of church history at that time and what God was doing in various places in the world. Um, so there is a Philadelphia portion of the church, and then there is a lukewarm portion of the church as well, before we get to chapter 4 and John's second vision and the rapture of the church. But tonight, we'll follow the same outline that we've done for the other five churches, and they all follow the same way. There's a destination given. There's a description of Jesus, usually found in chapter 1, except tonight is the exception. Uh, there's a commendation given for most, a rebuke for some, or exhortation, finally a warning or a promise. So chapter 13, uh, so, sorry, <laughs> 13, 3, verse 7. If, if you, maybe before we start, if you can find uh, Isaiah chapter 22 in your Bibles, we're going to go there in a few minutes to kind of give you some insight into one of the comments that's made in this letter that we wouldn't maybe understand otherwise. So just Isaiah 22, and then we'll be able to jump over there quickly when we get started. Chapter 3, verse 7, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, Angel, like I said, is angelos. It means messenger, pastor, overseer. The church of Philadelphia was only 25 miles or so south and then east of where Sardis was. You know its name means brotherly love. It was built in honor of King Philadelphus of Pergamus. He built this city for his brother, King Eumenus. It was a Greek city early on, even in Jesus' day. They worshipped a lot of very pagan gods. Their chief god was Dionysius, the god of wine and revelry. Maybe some of you remember worshipping at his altar when you were younger. The place was filled with vineyards. It was a place of, of tremendous vineyard growth. Along with Sardis, not too far from them, the place was leveled by an earthquake, 17 AD. It was rebuilt by Tiberius, as was Sardis. It was very resistant in the first century to Muslim influence. And throughout the Middle Ages, it was able to, I'm, I'm not, I shouldn't say from the first century, from, during the Middle Ages, it, it resisted the Muslim influence, which kind of gripped the land. Uh, and today still exists. The, the name of the place today is Al-Asir. al -Asir, it, it, it means the city of God. There are some really good Christian churches in town that you can find on, on the internet and, and even follow if you like. There are also 45 mosques in town. So it's an interesting place. In this letter uh, from Jesus to this church, there isn't the slightest hint of a rebuke. If I was going to pick what letter I wanted, I'd want this one writ, wrote to me from the Lord. It's a refreshing letter of praise and, and promise and encouragement. 
It is a church fellowship that is reaching out in faith, was, was alive in Jesus, had extended themselves to the full, were, were eagerly waiting the Lord to come back, served him with a loving heart. And like I said, if you, if, I don't think you could pick a better letter to receive from the Lord. The, the description of Jesus up to this point has been from chapter 1. We, we've pointed out that if you go back to chapter 1 and the vision that John is given of, of Jesus starting in verse 12 and going down through verse 16, uh, the Lord in his letters picks a portion of that vision that John saw that kind of lines up with what he wanted to say to the church that he was writing to. But that isn't the case here. Instead, Jesus takes a title for himself from another part of the Old Testament, where we're going to go here in just a minute, a well-known prophecy which uh, spoke of he being God. But he starts first there in verse 7 with these words. This thing, uh, these things says he who is holy and he who is true. The word holy, when it applies to God, is both a title and a characteristic that can only be applied to the Lord and then applied to us in the Lord. But it is a, a description of, of God's character, of his uniqueness. The word holy means to be set apart. In other words, there's no one like him. When the Lord calls you holy, it means that you are dedicated only to him. You've, you've been bought with a price, so you're, you're separated. I think we use the example of putting your name on a, on a cup of a picnic, you know, and no one else should be drinking out of it. That's your cup. Well, you're his kid, and you, you're the one that should be serving him. So he's holy. It says, obviously, everywhere. There is no one like him. He's without sin. He's unique. He's separate. In this holiness, and because of his holiness, God demands judgment for sin. Because of his, his nature, he is holy. So, you know, you, you can say, well, Lord, you know, we've all sinned. Just sweep that under the rug and let's get going which makes sense until you realize God's holy. He's got to deal with, with sin in a holy manner, which is why his son had to be sent. This is a payment that justifies the holiness and the justice of God. So this is the one Jesus says, I, I'm the one who is unique, and I am the one that is true. In Greek, the word true just means genuine, or if you will, you know, the real thing, in opposition to all of the false gods and all of the, the false ways of men, Jesus is the one that is truly God. Jesus would say in John uh, to the boys in chapter 19, uh, no, 17, verse 3, I think, as he's praying there at the Kidron Brook, and he says to them, this is eternal life, that, you, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. John would write in 1 John chapter 5, we know that the Son of God has come, that he has given us an understanding that we might know him who is true, that we can be in him who is true in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Another way of just saying he's the real deal. He's unique and he's, he's the one that you can count on. All of God's promises are, are, are tied in him. Well, then we read here in verse 7, he who has the keys of David... He who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. It is a direct quote from the only other place in the Bible that has this phrase, and that's why I wanted you to turn to uh, Isaiah chapter 22. So if you can just flip over there for a few minutes, kind of hold your place, and, and look over at verse 15 of Isaiah 22. Because here the Lord tells a story in the prophetic book of Isaiah about two men from history. One man, very self-serving. He was well-received by the nation of Israel in his place. He laid out a future for himself that he thought would really be a good way to live. And yet the Lord says of him, his judgment was certain. There is another man in the story who was God's choice, but would not be recognized as such for quite some time. He would eventually be recognized, but the people initially refused him. It is a beautiful picture in prophetic language of the Antichrist coming to fool the nation, God rejecting and dealing with this, this false prophet, if you will, and then the coming of Jesus who will open doors that no man can shut, 
and closed doors that no man can open. In other words, he's not only holy and he true, but there's, there's no one like him. He'll make a decision as to what happens. Both of these men used in this word from the Lord lived in the days of Isaiah um, and in the days of Hezekiah. You can find these two men's names in 2 Kings chapter 18 as well. But like because we find them in the book of Revelation and Jesus takes the title for himself, we can place the symbolism, if you will, or the impl implication, the inference upon Jesus' oversight and his being able to say to this church of Philadelphia, uh, you know, you've been faithful. I'm going to set before you an opener. No one's going to be able to stop you. And no one's going to be able to turn you away because I'm the Lord. I'm true. I'm holy. I'm the one that you can follow. You've, you've made the right choice. But but the, the illusion or the, the, the illustration, is, there's, this is the only other place that those words are found um, in this kind of a format about the key, keys of David and all. And so we, we kind of have to look back here to get uh, understanding. Verse 15 says, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Go and proceed to this steward, to Shebna, who is over the house. Say to him, What have you here? Whom have you here? That you would hewn out a sepulcher here, and who hews himself a sepulcher on high, carves a tomb, for himself in a rock. Indeed, the Lord is going to throw you away violently, O mighty man. He will certainly seize you. He will surely turn violent and toss you like a ball into a large country, and there you will die. You and your glorious chariots shall be the shame of your father of the master's house, so I will drive you out of your office, and from your position he will pull you down. Then it shall be in that day, that I shall call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. I'll dress him with a robe and, and strengthen him with a belt. I will commit your responsibility into his hands. He'll be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to the house of Judah. The keys of the house of David I will lay upon his shoulders so he can open and no one can shut. He can shut, no one can open. It will fasten him as a peg in a secure place and he will become a glorious throne to his father's house. And they shall hang on him all of the glory of his father's house, the offspring, the posterity, the vessels of, of small quantities, the cups to all of the pitchers. And in that day, saith the Lord, the, the peg that is fastened in the secure place will be removed, cut down and fall. The burden that was, uh, that was on it will fall off, for the Lord has spoken. And so we, we get this very prophetic, and until you read Revelation and you go read the history in 2 Kings, you might just say, oh, that's confusing. And I would agree with you that if you haven't done your homework, it very well could be. Shebna was a scribe, a leader at the time of his existence. He had great hopes for his fame. He was so sure of his place in Israel's history that before he was very old, he had already carved out a sepulcher for himself, cut out a tombstone into the rocks outside of Jerusalem as a legacy. If you go with us to Israel, and our hopes is to go a year from March, um, in East Jerusalem on the west slopes of the Mount of Olives, there's, there are still a lot of rocks and, and tombstones carved out of rock done by some of the prophets of old that really wanted to stand in the Kidron Valley and, and be recognized as you go up into the temple area. God says to Shibna, what do you think you're doing? carving for yourself a place. And then he says, you're not even going to die here. The Assyrians would come in and would overthrow the northern kingdom due to their pride, and, and, would, uh, and the, then Judah would escape. But a, a hundred years later, a little bit more, uh, they would fall to the Babylonians. So this guy was going to be taken away and really die in a foreign country. But, you know, he seemed to have such great success among the people. Everyone uh, embraced him, but it he certainly wasn't successful in the long run. By comparison, beginning in verse 20, this fellow Eliakim, who was another one of Hezekiah's um, cabinet members, he exemplified God's choice and plans for the future. He was the prime minister under Hezekiah, um, and he would decide who could see you know, Hezekiah the king and who could not. He was kind of the, the fella in the minute, middle, middle. The only person who could overthrow his decisions was the king himself. So Israel was courted by this first guy, deceived for a while, 
And then the true Messiah will be unveiled, Jesus, who, according to verse 22, is the same that is speaking to the church of, uh, of uh, Philadelphia and saying, I have the authority to open and shut. I'm the Messiah. I have the keys of David. I, I, I line up with the promises of the Messiah that was promised to David. That's me. And so I'm going to open doors for you that no man can shut. To this church, Jesus declares himself to be God and, and tells them that they are in good stead, having him to be the one that will go before them in the ministry in the world that they are seeking to accomplish. God says, I'm going to bless you, man. <laughs> I'm going to go in front of you and, and behind you, and, and I'll open every door. The key, uh, or, or I should say, at the end of the verses, verse 24 and verse 25, the prophecy ends by saying, the peg Jesus and his type Eliakim, Eliakim was, was man's hope for, in a physical sense eventually, um, but he would obviously die, still a man, and then the one that would follow him would bring eternal life. So we read the words in that day in like manner. This is the one that you know is portrayed Jesus in in prophetic, if you will, terms. But but the key is back in verse thirty two, uh, twenty two. Sorry, that's the the quote that we're taking out of our text tonight, right? That Jesus gives entrance into the kingdom, that he's the one who uh, provides the resources for the church to do its work. It's a great introduction of himself by name. It isn't found in chapter 1. It is the only one that breaks that rule. You can go back to Revelation now if you want. Um, but, but it is in that same manner that the keys of heaven, by the way, are, are, are handed to the church. You, you remember some of those verses probably, right? We're, we're in, in, oh gosh, where is it? Matthew chapter 16. Uh, Jesus said to his disciples, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom, the keys for heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose upon the earth, loose in heaven. Jesus said the exact same thing to the disciples on Easter Sunday evening as he breathed on them, they received the Holy Spirit. And then he said the same things to them, that, that he would give them uh, you know, the power to retain sins or to forgive them. It means to, to be able to say to people, here's how your sins can be forgiven, and here's how your sins will never be forgiven. It, it, he gave them the the, the gospel to go and preach to others. So in, in like manner, Jesus has the keys. He's the, he's the fulfillment of the, of the promise to David. He's the one that will, will, will lead the church in the church age to be uh, successful, even when there seems to be very little places to go. But when it's applied prophetically to the end times, um, it'll be the Antichrist that first comes to the nation of Israel and fools them. And, and for a little while, they'll embrace him, but he's not the one that God has chosen and eventually he will be judged. So lots of prophecy hidden in there as well, but I think it's worth going to look at it. And, you know, when people say the book of Revelation can be hard, well, here's a phrase that you won't find anywhere else but one place. So you're pretty safe to go to that one place and, and define it based on what God has given it to you there. Um, if, if you compare what the scribes and the Pharisees were told by, by Jesus um, in Matthew 23, when the Lord goes after these false prophets and these poor teachers, and, and he says to them, you hypocrites, you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, neither will you go in or will you allow others to enter. So <laughs> they were working against God's work, if you will. They were working against what God wanted to do. So we have the key. The, the key is Jesus. So let's go back now in verse 8 of uh, chapter 3 in Revelation here, where we, we, we hear then Jesus saying, I know your work. See, I have set before you an open door and no man should shut it. So if you're wondering, he applies it to himself and then he applies it to their lives. The application is, is from him. And Jesus begins by saying, I think I've mentioned it six times now, right? Every church, I know your works. Here he adds that his awareness of their works leads him to give them an open door. Or if you will, the way that they have lived their lives as God's people in this generation caused them to find God's blessing as they went forward. He, he, he'll open the door and no one will shut it. Nothing can stand in your way. I've always loved that whole concept because I know that so often the church laments, oh, you know, we're fighting the government. We're fighting rules and regulations. We're fighting people. We're having difficult times with the city. Look, God's bigger than all that stuff. 
And if he sets before you an open door, you don't sweat it. And if he shuts before you a shut door, what do you want to do except run into it and hurt yourself? Right? He's not going to open it. So I, I think there's great things to be learned from, from God's word in terms of, you know, how do, we, how do we live our lives as God's people in a world that doesn't know the Lord? And the thing is, we really can't be overcome. Right? We, 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 can, we can find difficulties, struggles, ch challenges, but they're not, God's not going, man, I didn't know it was going to be this hard. You know, he knows exactly what's going on. If he opens the door, no man's going to shut it. So we use the terms uh, open door, and it's used a lot in the New Testament to talk about God giving us opportunity and outreach or in service. Um, when Paul and, and showed up, I think, with Barnabas in Antioch in Acts chapter 14, uh, he said, I gathered the church together and told them all the things that the Lord was doing with us. And then it says, and how he opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. It's a great word. You know, God set before us an open door. You, 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 you read about it a lot. He, he writes about his, his experience in Troas, Paul does to the Corinthians. He says, I came to Troas and a door was opened for me by the Lord. He wrote to the Colossians in chapter 4, could you pray for us that God would set before us an open door? I think that's a good prayer. Put on your prayer list. God set before the church an open door so we're not running into the wall. In these last days, walking with Jesus should find no shortages of open doors. When, when, when Jesus spoke to Peter there and changed his name up in the northern Galilee area, he said to him, your name's going to be called Peter. Because on this rock, not on Peter's name, because Peter's name means pub pebble. But upon this rock, the rock being his declaration of what his belief in Jesus was, who he was. Upon this rock I will build my church, and he said, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So the promises of fruitfulness where God goes before and opens the door means that, that if we really trust the Lord and walk with him, there really is no need for us to be striving or struggling or try to provide artificial respiration to ministries that aren't going anywhere, or trying to pump people up or beg for money or, or try to strain a cause or, come on, join the work, you know, we can do it. We don't need to do that. If God opens the door and his spirit is poured out, it ought to be just, it ought to be a blessing to the church. And, and this is a last Jay's church in many ways. You know, if, if you're constantly struggling and banging your head against the wall, maybe you're not where you need to be. I, I expect to see open doors. We don't always get them. Sometimes doors just slam in our face. I can't begin to tell you how many times we tried moving to a bigger place. Even to a few years ago, we bought a place, 18 acres, for a lot of money. <laughs> Would have put us in debt for a long time. But it could have given us the opportunity to do whatever we want. And we, we sold this place, and we had investors that were going to buy this place, and we had a year or two given to us free where we could stay while the other place was built. And the day we were going to sign the contracts, they found some problems on the land we were going to buy. And we said, well, then we, we can't do this. He said to the man buying our place, are you going to, your investor's going to wait? He goes, no. So we said, well, then we can't buy this place. And we gave it all back to them. Four weeks later, they cleared it up, and we'd already made a commitment to build here. It was nice to have an open door, but we first ran into a closed one, headlong at 100 miles an hour. God does what God does. It's his church. So I think we should be looking for open doors. And when the Lord opens the door, you know, then we should see expansion and churches planted and lives changed and extra elders raised up and fruit that follows. It should be the Lord's church. Jesus gives to this church three reasons for his blessings to be poured out upon them. And I just love the verse. Because you read in verse 8, I know your works. I've, I've set before you an open door. No one's going to shut it. And then he says these three things. For you have a little strength, and you have kept my word, and you haven't denied my name. I just, I couldn't be happier. You've had, you have a little strength. Whoever these folks were, they, they, they weren't a large church with much influence. They didn't have a lot of influential people in their church. 
I suspect they haven't, didn't have a big building. Well, they didn't have any building first century. Uh, they didn't have huge numbers. They probably didn't have lots of outreaches. But they had shown God great faithfulness in the little things that God had given them. In other words, they had done as much as they could with what they, with what they have been given. Which, by the way, is God's only way in the Bible of growth. God looks for faithfulness from us in the little things. If you're faithful in the little, then God will give you much. And the only motive for being faithful in the little is that you love the Lord. There's no glory in it. There's no financial gain in it. You can't promote yourself in it because there's nothing going on. You just have to be faithful in the little. So it sustains you because that's all you have to go with. I want to do this as on to the Lord. And if you are faithful to serve him faithfully, then God will give you more. He'll entrust greater things to you. You remember the story of the talents there in Matthew 25 where, where when Jesus handed out talents to 110. He said, I've, I've made 10 more to the one who gave five, he says, Lord, where are, the, where are the five talents? The Lord says, here, Lord, I've, I've delivered, you've delivered five talents. So I've gained five more. And, and the Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So God just wants us faithful. And, and, and you should point, you know, in the, in the church that God gives the greatest applause to and recognition to and, and sees the greatest things that please him, he's able to say to them, because of how you're going about your work, nothing shall be kept from you. And because you've only had a little strength and been faithful, I'm going to shut open the door so you're going to have a lot of things that you can accomplish. Our feebleness, faithfully applied, will bring his blessings powerfully given. Our faith, uh, feebleness, faithfully applied, will bring his blessings powerfully given. I think if you're a ministry overseer or you're in a home Bible study or you're starting a work, you know, in the mission field or whatever it might be, and maybe not many people are showing up yet. No, man, come on, Lord, bless this thing. And, you know, and it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. I think if you'll be faithful in the little, God will give you much. If you're slothful and expect more, you're probably going to lose even what little thing that you have. When I first started teaching as a young guy in a home Bible study in which I got saved, I really took over the study. I think I was 19 years old. And there was 80 people in a house in Bellflower. And the guy that was teaching it was an older gentleman. He was going to move to Oregon to start a, a Bible college or something. And, and he said to me, why don't you take the study? I said, well, I've only been saved for like a year. He goes, oh, I know, but you love the Lord. God will use you. I said, all right, I'll, of course I'll do it. <laughs> I was really excited. Three weeks into my tenure, four people showed up for Bible study out of 70. Three of them belonged to one family <laughs> and one other guy. So if that family got sick, pretty much it showed in the church numbers. And I remember going to a guy in, in Long Beach, a friend who was a pastor, and saying to him, I still want to teach God's word. I know God will bless his word. What am I doing wrong? And he said to me, <laughs> He was patient with me. I was a young guy, really driven to. He said, you know, if you're willing to give all of your time and energy to teach four people, God can use you. But if that's too little for you, God's got nothing for you. And I left, thought, well, what a jerk. <laughs> that's exactly what I thought driving home. What an idiot. I don't know. But he was right. You know, if you're willing to do and serve one, then God can use you to serve many. So... In this letter, prophetically, we learn from Jesus that the last day's church should have a little strength. You know, we're not going to go out in a blaze of glory. Even these kingdom theology people, if you've read any of their nonsense, um, should know better. If you listen to the, the visions of Daniel for the world kingdoms and how they proceeded forward from the days of Nebuchadnezzar, all of the visions for the world kingdoms just get weaker as they go. Jesus was able to say, you know, when I come back, will I find faith upon the earth? I don't think that the church is going to go out in a blaze of glory. The world around us is getting worse. Jesus said in Matthew 24, because of lawlessness abounding, the love of many are going to wax cold. 
This is not going to be, we're not going to, you know, like rise to the top. <laughs> we're going to have little strength, but we're going to get a lot done because we're going to let the Lord be the Lord and, and be the one that we look to. Little strength in your life is enough to do great things in the Lord. Little strength is enough. Oh, I want great strength. You just need a little strength. All we need is God's hand upon us. A little strength in God's hand is all we'll ever need. And the saints here in Philadelphia had learned, and, and Jesus acknowledges their faithfulness. God can make a lot out of nothing. Just look around here at what God can do. As long as he gets the glory. When, when, when Jesus told Paul about his thorn in the flesh, my grace is sufficient to you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. It says the same thing, right? So, I'm going to set before you a door that no one can shut because I know your works and you've had a little strength. They were outnumbered. The church was not so influential. There are no leadership uh, notes or, or, or le outstanding leaders of note. The body was moving forward by God's glory. God saw it. He promised more things for them, not less. When, when Paul wrote to the uh, Corinthians in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, he said, a great and effective door have opened to me as the Lord opened for me, and there are great adversaries or many adversaries. But he, he noticed that God would go before him. And I, I, I hope that that's what you're praying for, for us as a church in this community. God needs to open doors so that this community can know Jesus. That's why we're here. And certainly that's what we pray for. Secondly, we read in verse 8, you have kept my words. If you really want to know what defines your love for the Lord, this is it. It's obedience. My dad used to say to me, if you love me, you'd listen to me. Oh, I love you, Dad, but I'm not going to listen to you. Jesus said in John 14, verse 21, if you have my commandments and you keep them, you're the one who loves me. I'll just leave it at that. I mean, I, you can argue with that all night if you want, but... If you love the Lord, you're going to get your Bible out and go, I want to do what God tells me. I want to do it even if I have trouble with it. I want to do it even sometimes I don't agree with it. I want to do it because the Lord says so. And, and the greatest definitive proof of your love for the Lord is your obedience. I wonder how many churches have altogether forsaken the regular teaching of the Bible. You've kept my word and replaced it with emotional appeals, with social kind of messages with trying to be relevant and up-to-date. and uh, I would challenge you to get on the computer and begin to look around and see how many churches have a resource page that allows you to find the, a Bible study verse by verse through the prophets in the Old Testament. Just see how many you can find. If you find 20, I'll, I'll give you a high five. They're just not available. People like to hear relevant messages that touch our world, and we got to talk about baloney. We just need to know what God says, and we'll do real good in the world if we walk with God. So, you know, there's a lot of places that just, you know, there there are Sunday school curriculums that we can buy here that we get offers to buy that teach evolution as a distinct possibility. Sunday school materials that go into churches. Homosexual pastors who claim acceptance with God. Churches that turn away from God's word to secular psychology for a peace that they'll never give. You know, there's pressure to abandon the book of Genesis for science. <laughs> yeah, we've learned all about science, haven't we? There, there's a, a, a call to turn away from salvation by redemption through anthropology. There's a call to turn away from life in the spirit to psychology. The, the Bible itself is constantly the subject of higher criticism. By the way, the Bible is the most scrutinized book in the history of, of man, and it still stands. People have gone after it for years, and it says just fine. Thank you very much. I have no difficulty believing the entire thing. I've never heard one argument or reason as, in all my years as a pastor that would challenge me to question what God has said. Yet I've seen God do it time and time again. He's fulfilled his word. No cancel culture is going to cancel this book because God's true and, and holy and sure. 
And what does he say to this last day's church? He says, I know your works. I'm giving you an open door. You have only had a little strength, but you have kept my word. That's, that's where your strength comes from. And finally, you haven't denied my name. If you remember back in Pergamos in chapter 2, verse um, 13, there were those in Pergamos who had just stuck with the Lord no matter what. They, they stuck with his name. And by the way, not denying his name implies that you believe what his name entails, that he's the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, that he has come to die and rose again. Imagine trying to live out those vital truths when you're locked in a society that is completely built on idolatry, and you, you just stick out like a sore thumb. Paul approached very wisely in Acts uh, 17, those folks up on Mars Hill as he stood up in the Aragopagus, and he, he tried to talk to them about the grave of the unknown God that he knew, the God that he knew. But it was a, it's a tough place to, to excel when the whole world is worshiping a false god. So Jesus gives them an open door. They've been faithful in their little strength. They've kept God's word, and they've been faithful to him. They haven't denied who he is. And so God says, I'm going to open the doors for you, and I'm going to leave them open, and they're going to be available to you. This is the church we want to be, isn't it? Uh, this, is the, this, is the, this is the letter I want, to, I want the Lord to send to us. There is no rebuke in, in this letter at all. In fact, in verse 9, he says this to them, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they're Jews, but they're not. They lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet to know that I've loved you. Because you have kept my commandment to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which is about to come upon the whole earth, and to test those who dwell, or in the whole world, and to test those who dwell upon the earth. He, instead of rebuke, gives them two wonderful promises of protection. A protection from the hostility of unbelievers, religious ones at that, and an exoneration of their faith in the future where they will see themselves standing before God and the people who persecuted them having to bow down to the God that they're serving and say, well, you were right. <laughs> you were right and we were wrong. A deliverance from, from, from the wrath of God to come, the great tribulation that was going to come upon the whole earth. So, verse 9, Jesus talks about the synagogue of Satan, those who are saying that they're Jews and they're not. We've run into them before. But, but again, it is the, the persecution that comes, religious you know, persecution from the enemy. It, it's the enemy disguised in religious clothing. I think Jesus said there in John chapter 8 to those who said they believed in the Lord, you are of your father the devil. And the father, you know, and, and you do always, he's a murderer from the beginning. He doesn't stand for the truth. There's no truth in him. When he lies, he, he speaks it by his own resource. And you belong to him. But they said, oh, Lord, we'll follow you wherever you go. They hardly meant what they said. There were religious persecution. The enemy here as before is the, is the religious community attacking the Philadelphian saints. One day they're going to bow their knees to me and they're going to know I loved you. And I'm going to deliver you from the trials that are coming upon the earth. The great tribulation. The word out of, out of, ek. In, in, in Greek it's the word ek, but it means to be delivered from, not through, but from. Um, so they kept his word. God would keep them from judgment. His wrath would be poured out. There, there's a verse in, in Revelation chapter 6 when we get there where the people that are left after the church is taken out, and the church is found in heaven in chapter 4 and 5, and, and the, the, the difficulty starts in chapter 6, verse 3. But in any event, in, in early on describing those that are left behind, we read there in chapter 6 that the people alive began to cry out to the mountains and to the rocks, and they say, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. And now, who is able to stand? And Jesus says to the church walking with him, I'll get you out of here. I'll deliver you to the true believers. Not, not to the religious community, but to the true believers. I will deliver you. In fact, Jesus in, in Luke 21 said to the disciples, pray and watch always that you might be Pray that you might be counted worthy to escape 
the things that are going to come to pass, to be able to stand before the Son of Man. Pray that you're walking in a, in a life that brings you out before the judgment of God falls. So it's going to test those upon the earth, all right. And, and I think we're going to discover as we go that this test for many during the Great Tribulation is going to lead them to Christ. In fact, it is my firm conviction that more people will get saved during the tribulation than have been saved since the days of Adam. I'll try to prove that to you, but not tonight. But I'll make you think about it anyway. But I think that that is correct. Um, and that should be the case. Praise the Lord that when God's judgment falls, people go, okay, I can't do this anymore. There'll be plenty who, who won't, but, but these obviously will. So, Verse 11, behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast that what you have, that no man would take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the, in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. And I'll write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which shall come down of, out of heaven from my God, and I write on him my new name. Behold, I come quickly. The word um, is teku. It, it means uh, suddenly or unexpectedly. When he comes, he comes in a moment's time. Obviously, you know, the, the rapture will be such that um, if you're not watching, it'll overtake you. But it, we should not have that happen to us. We should be watching. Hold fast that which you have. It's a present um, tense imperative. It means it's a command. And it needs to be applied every moment of the day. So in every, every day, don't, don't let go of the Lord. You've, you've gotten this far with your dedication and your loyalty and your commitment. It has sustained you. Continue in that because you really don't know, you know when the Lord is coming. So hang in there, man. Day or night, you've got to be ready. So that no man take your crown. The word crown here is, is singular. And uh, I suspect that it refers to the crown of life. Uh, it is symbolic of the victory that Jesus will bring to you. Uh, the, gr the Greek word for crown is the word for Stephen, St Stephanos. It's, it, it describes a laurel wreath that was given to the, to the winner of the Olympic Games. <laughs> Not a gold medal, you got a wreath on your head. That's exactly what you were given. But it, it denoted that you, you, you won the battle. You, you came out on top. Deny the Lord, walk away from the Lord. Look, nobody has any assurance of, of where you stand. I, I, I am convinced biblically that you cannot lose your salvation, that the work that Jesus began in you, he'll complete it in the day of Jesus Christ, that he can present you faultless before his throne with great glory, that no one can snatch me out of his hand. Um, if I can't save myself, I certainly can't keep myself. So I trust that the Lord is going to do that. But the words here is a warning to those who may very well not be walking with God at all, but they're in the church. They're church folks. And, and like every letter, there's, there's promises to the overcomers, he who overcomes, verse 12, and then there's promises to those who you know, are just sitting amongst the believers, if you will, and they're, in, and they're in a dangerous place. So when you walk with the Lord, that gives you great assurance, right? When you walk with the Lord, then we look at your life and go, oh, he, he walked with the Lord all of his life. We have great assurance. Verse 12, he promises, Jesus does to the church, the same things that you find in these other letters, permanence and security and identity. Notice in verse 12, permanence, you're going to be a pillar in the, in the temple. Now, that's got to be a figurative statement, yet it's pretty cool to have a little strength now and have a permanence of, of strength in the house of God to be like a pillar, isn't it? So... Um, We'll have a permanent part in the house, in the dwelling place of the Lord. Secondly, we'll have security. Notice that the words, you, you will go out no more. I love that. When you get to heaven, that's going to be it. No coming back for another life. <laughs> no trying to do it over. From Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22, God says, you're home at last. And thirdly, you have an identity. Now, notice there's three names given here. The name of the Father, the name of the new city, not Philadelphia, but the new Jerusalem, and then the, name, the new name of the Son. Um, 
Revelation chapter 22, verse 4 says, they'll see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. So there's going to be a lot of names on us, new names, nicknames. We're going to be, I think, I think the whole thing is you're going to be branded, right? You're going to be clearly marked as belonging to God. You're going to be more clearly marked than a sales item on a sales rack. You're going to belong to him. He owns you. There'll be no doubt. That's okay, isn't it? Put that tattoo on me, Lord. He who has ears to hear, singular, let him hear, singular, what the Spirit is saying to the plural, to the church as a whole. So, faithful church, little strength, good work, keeping his word, not denying his name. And one day, glory waits for you. Hey, look, it's hard right now to be a Christian. It's going to be great on that day to be a Christian, though. When every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, and the Lord says, these are the ones I love who've walked with me. I can't wait. Next week, not so easy. The lukewarm church. When you have to read verses that say, I wish that you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. That's far different than what we read tonight. But I hopefully we'll, we'll capture the heart of God there as well. So next week we will finish the last church, and then we'll get to the rapture. And for two chapters, we're going to go to heaven and hang around Jesus. We're going to learn songs so that none of you will show up not knowing them. If you show up not knowing them, you went to Raul Reese's church. You tell them that. Don't you mention Morningstar at all. I'll remind you of that next week or two. Father, thank you for gathering us together tonight. We're so thankful that, that Lord, you have a heart for the church. You, you birthed us. You want to direct us. The, these letters have been so powerful. I know that there's lots for us to think about and apply to our own hearts and lives. And I pray that, Lord, even as you end every one of these letters with calling us to, to hear what your spirit is saying, I pray that we are listening and Lord, when it applies to us and when it hits home and when we realize that you're talking directly to us in this verse, that we'll respond correctly. So that would be more of the church that you want us to be, the like in these last days as we wait for you. We will be faithful. We have little strength. We won't, we'll keep your word, not deny your name. We'll be, we'll be proud of being God's people in a world that thinks that's silly. In a world that would like us to to, I guess, get with the times when all we want to do is serve you. As we think about these churches in the first century and all they were facing, no t different for us today. So Lord, may we, may we find that little strength is plenty when you're with us, that we don't need to fight the world's battles in our flesh, but we can fight them on our knees and in prayer and in faith and in confidence but unless the Lord build the house, we're laboring in vain. Lord, may you set before us open doors, but we know that they come more often to those who have little strength and keep your word. Don't deny your name. And I pray that that would be your testimony tonight. You may not be the strongest, the wisest, <laughs> the most accomplished, but you trust him, you obey him, and then God can do great things. Because everything that you might bring to the table is kind of useless. Except yourself and your willingness to let him use you as his vessel. Then you find great strength. And his strength is made perfect in your weakness. If tonight you don't know who Jesus is. If you don't have a relationship with him. If you're a religious person, but you know, you're hoping that that will satisfy God's demands. It will not. God didn't send his son Jesus to die for your sins so he could be one of three doors that you could choose. He sent him because he's the only door. Just door number one. That's all you get. And if you'll go to him, he'll fight, find, and he'll give you life. He'll, he'll wash your sins. He'll, he'll put his spirit within you. He'll, he'll make you his own and begin to lead you in, in the ways of life. Pastors will be up front here over in the multi-purpose room as well. There'll be a pastor there. If you're online, you can look down in the comment section. Uh, leave a message for the church if you want, or call us, or just follow the links. You'll find it on our webpage, what it means to know Jesus and give him your life. 
important you go read that tonight. So God can just do what he's promised to you who would turn to him. And God will then keep you from the hour that's coming that will test those upon the earth and put their theories of God to the test as we instead gather around his throne and worship. Little, little strength, not so bad. Powerful God, absolutely great.